Congress Vice President, respected Sri Rahul Gandhiji, former Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh Ji, members of the Congress Working Committee, members of the AICC, chief ministers, presidents of the PCCs, presidents of the DCCs, delegates from the Youth Congress, NSUI, Mahila Congress, Sevadal, and other frontal organizations, friends from all over India. There is a statement in both English and Hindi which captures what has happened over the last two and a half years, particularly what has happened over the last 70 days. I don't intend to read the statement nor will I explain the contents at great length. I want you to understand the grave damage that has been done to an economy that has been built brick by brick in the last 25 to 30 years. In the last 30 years, we have had challenges. We've had grave challenges in 1991. We had a very severe international financial crisis in 1997. The world economy almost collapsed in 2008. We had a setback in 2012. Yet at every stage, thanks to the guiding hand of the Congress Party, we protected our economy and continue to build it brick by brick over the last 30 years. In a 10-year period, 2004 to 2014, 14 crore people were lifted out of poverty. Never before in human history have so many people been lifted out of poverty in a period of 10 years. Congress Vice President Sri Rahul Gandhiji spoke about the various initiatives taken by the present government. Each one was an event, and the BJP government is the best event manager known to Indian history. Each event lasts a few weeks or a few months and then replaced by another event. People no longer speak about Swachh India, no longer speak about Skill India, no longer speak about Make in India, Startup India, Stand Up India. What people want to know is, when will there be jobs in India? When will jobs come back to this country? People want to know when there will be social harmony in India. When will there be social harmony among different communities? And people want to know when there will be peace in India, when there will be peace in our borders and our jawans are not killed every day. All that is captured in this statement. The statement captures the atrocities inflicted on Dalits. There can be no better example than what happened in Una, Gujarat. It captures the rage in colleges and universities. There can be no better example than the last testament of Rohit Vemula, the young scholar of Hyderabad who died writing a letter where he said, my birth is my fatal 
accident. All that is captured in this statement. But today, I'm going to take a few minutes to explain to you the enormity of the calamity imposed upon us on the 8th of November 2016 in the name of demonetization. I have spoken on several occasions. I've spoken on television channels. I've written columns. Many of you may be familiar with the arguments that I made. India is no different from any other country. Most people use cash. And most people have a right to use cash. When the Prime Minister says he will make India a cashless society, he's talking about something which has not happened anywhere in the world. More than that, he's talking about something he has no right to do. It is my right to use cash. It is my right to use a credit card. It is my right to use a debit card. It is my right to write out a check. That is my right as a citizen. I decide for myself. When I buy adult diapers, when a lady wants to buy undergarments, when an elder citizen wants to buy medicine, it is my right to decide whether I will buy it by cash or whether I will leave a record. This is understood by every civilized country. In Germany, one of the most developed countries of the world, 80% of transactions are in cash. In Austria, 80% are in cash. In Australia, 60% is by cash. In France, 52% is by cash. In the United States, 46% is by cash. In fact, if you count the volume of American dollars and European euros that are in circulation, the total currency in circulation in the form of dollars and euro has actually doubled in the last 10 years. People are using more cash, not less cash, because they realize it is my right, it is the individual right to decide whether you will use cash or not cash. In India, for centuries, we have used cash. 94% of all transactions in India are by cash. Cash in the hands of a farmer, cash in the hands of a self-employed, a lady who makes and sells pav bhaji in the streets of Mumbai, or idlis on the streets of Tamil Nadu, a lady outside the Hanuman temple having flowers and making garlands and selling it, somebody who sells vegetables, somebody who sells fruit. All of them deal with cash. It is their right to deal with cash, and the cash in their hands is not black money. It is perfectly legitimate money. In one stroke of the pen, the Prime Minister said 500 rupee notes and 1,000 rupee notes will no longer be legal tender. And he set out three objectives. First, he said, black money. Then he said, fake currency. And then he said, corruption. According to him, on 8th of November, he killed black money, he killed corruption, and he put an end to fake currency. 70 days later, there should be no black money. 70 days later, nobody should give bribes or take bribes. 70 days later, there should be no fake currency. I'm asking the Prime Minister to put his promises to test. 
in the last week, I'm not talking about what happened in 70 days, in the last week, in exactly seven days before today, 7.6 lakhs in new 2,000 rupee notes were seized in Kanpur. Is that black money or white money? 8 lakhs were seized in Ujjain. Is that black money or white money? 10 lakhs were seized in Meerut. Is that black money or white money? 20 lakhs were seized on the highway to Moradabad. Is that black money or white money? I'm throwing another challenge. In the month of May and June, medical colleges will open. Engineering colleges will open. They will charge capitation fee. Let the Prime Minister say, I've killed black money. In the month of May, in the month of June, no parent need worry. No student need worry. Nobody will ask capitation fee. Nobody will take capitation fee. Let him do that promise. Can he give that promise today? Then the Prime Minister says, I put an end to corruption. The first instance of corruption in new 2,000 rupee note, 124 notes were seized in Kandla Port Trust in Gujarat. The first instance of corruption in new 2,000 rupee notes took place in Gujarat. Will the Prime Minister say, from 8th of November, nobody is taking bribes, nobody is asking for bribes? And then he says, this will put an end to fake currency. Fake currency is already available. They found fake currency in Kolkata Bank. They found fake currency in Punjab. They found a teacher having a fake currency factory yesterday. None of these objectives will be served. All that has happened is he has heaped misery upon crores and crores of India. 45 crore people in this country live on the basis of working every day, earning a daily wage or a daily income. 15 crore are manual laborers. He has to work. In every town, in every city, there is a place called a chowk. In Delhi, it is Chori Chowk, Chauri Chowk. Every town, there is a chowk where people come in the morning. A van will come, a lorry will come and take them to work. 15 crore people depend upon daily work. And if that work is not available to them on that day, they have no income, they cannot feed their families. 30 crore people depend upon a daily income. I told you, the flower seller, the fruit seller, the vegetable seller, all of them depend upon a daily income. If nobody buys from them that day, they have no income. For a full 60 days, 45 crore people's income has been taken away, wage has been taken away, livelihood has been taken away. Who will compensate them? Farmers, look at the crash in prices. Potatoes, tomatoes, peas, cauliflower, cabbage, oranges, every price crashed. I was in Nagpur. A ton of oranges was being sold for 40,000 rupees on November 7th. On the day I visited Nagpur, it was 25,000 rupees. Now, who will compensate that farmer? And we adopted a condolence resolution for over 100 people who died. Who will compensate those families? I demand that the government of India compensate the farmers of India for the huge losses because of crash in prices. I demand that the government of India compensate the daily worker, especially the manual worker, who lost his job, lost his work, and lost his wage for that day. And the way this decision was taken, it's now absolutely clear. This was a decision of one person, as the vice president said. One person decides. I'm the Führer, I'm the leader, I will decide what will happen in this country. Friends, 
who are the officials most intimately connected with the decision concerning money? The first person must be the finance secretary. The second person is the banking secretary. And the third person, the chief economic advisor. Now tell me, all of you read newspapers. In the last 70 days, have you heard the finance secretary make utter a word? In fact, his name would not have appeared in the newspapers. There is a banking secretary in charge of banking. In the last 70 days, have you heard the banking secretary speak a word? Above all, this government is only one economic advisor, the chief economic advisor. And for the last 70 days, have you heard the chief economic advisor utter a word? It's obvious that none of them was consulted. And it's now clear, it's now clear that the government of India wrote a letter to the RBI on the 7th of November asking the RBI to consider demonetization. Instead of the RBI advising the government of India, it is the government of India which advised the RBI to consider demonetization. RBI called a meeting on the 8th of November. I want to know, when did the RBI issue notice to its directors? How much time was given to the directors to attend the meeting? There are 10 independent director positions in the RBI. In the last two and a half years, seven have been kept vacant. There are only three independent directors. One of them did not attend the meeting. Only two of them attended the meeting. The meeting lasted no more than 30 days, 30 minutes. We asked for the agenda paper. RBI has not given it. We are asking for the minutes. RBI does not give the minutes. RBI sends its recommendation. The cabinet is waiting. How does the cabinet know that the RBI will recommend demonetization? The RBI could not have recommended demonetization. How is the cabinet waiting? RBI's recommendation comes to the cabinet. And I'm going to tell you something. According to the records that we have been able to access so far, there is no record of a cabinet meeting. A meeting is supposed to have taken place on the 8th of November, but there is no record of a cabinet meeting. Where is the cabinet note? Where is the cabinet decision? And the ministers were kept prisoners until the prime minister went on television and announced demonetization. Never before, never before in India's history has such a farce been enacted in the name of the government and exercising governmental powers and the RBI exercising the RBI's powers. Past governors of RBI have spoken up. Governor Reddy, Governor Jalan have all spoken up and said RBI's reputational risk, RBI's reputation is at risk today. I'm glad that the Vice President referred to the RBI as an institution which we nurtured and built. Dr. Manmohan Singh himself was governor of RBI for many years. Government and RBI have differences. Government and RBI have differences, but never has the government treated the RBI as some kind of a shorter department of the government of India. Today, we are in a situation where the economic losses are enormous. It's now absolutely clear that the GDP will be hit. It is only one person who says nothing will happen to the GDP, except the finance minister. Nobody in the world says the GDP will not be hit. The RBI has said GDP will come down from the original estimate of 7.6% to 7.1%. I will tell you, in my humble view, I may be right, I may be wrong, the GDP will be hit by more than 1%, it may be hit as much as 1.5%, it may be hit as much as 2%, as Dr. Manmohan Singh told Parliament. 1% decline in GDP, 1% decline in GDP means 1.5 lakh crore rupees lost to this country. 1.5 lakh crore rupees lost to this country. Apart from loss of income, loss of wages, loss of lives, loss of livelihood, industries closing down, 
small and medium industries closing down, car sales down 60%. The Fiat company did not produce a single car in the month of December. The entire factory was shut down. Not one car was produced. Jute, textiles, sugar, every one of them affected. 80% of small and medium industries shut down. Apart from all this, the economy is going to take a big hit. We are going to pay a price for the monumental folly of one person saying, I will decide what is good for this country. I think the Congress party must raise its voice, speak for the people. Ultimately, whether a decision is good or a decision is bad, every decision can only be tested on whether it helps the people of India, it helps the poor of India. There must be empathy for the poor. This decision was taken to heap misery in the poor. Millions and millions of people have suffered and continue to suffer and will suffer for the next two or three months. I commend this statement to you. I want you to read the statement in English or Hindi. I want you to go back and translate the statement into the local languages. This statement must reach every single home in India. And we will pay a price as long as we do not speak up. The more they challenge us, the more we must speak up. The more we must write, the more we must go and meet the people. Every challenge thrown by this government must be met with utmost courage, utmost wisdom, and only, with, and only the Congress, with its long history of sacrifice and struggle, can stand up to the challenges thrown by this government. Thank you.